Okay, we have been talking about the, uh, the armor of God. And obviously the theme of the Vacation Bible School has been a night's quest. And uh, what a great theme that is, scripturally based on Ephesians chapter 6, uh, where God instructs us what the various pieces uh, of His armor are. And uh, in case you have not been here uh, for each of these, we have, we have so far covered five uh, of the uh, pieces of armor, and we're going to talk about uh, just this one tonight, uh, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. But as we have done every night, and some of you have not been here, and so uh, this will be new information for you, but as we've done every night, we start with a troop briefing. Uh, we need to know what's going on. Uh, here, here we are. You know, if you just pick up the Bible and you read the Bible and God says, put on the whole armor of God, and He starts detailing these pieces, you, you might think, what in the world is this? You know, I thought he was a God of love, a God of peace, a God of compassion. Why are we talking about war? Why are we talking about armor? Well, because we've got to put this in the context of what's going on. And so we've, we've had a troop briefing at the beginning of each of our classes uh, this week. And each of the, the major points has started with the, with the letters in the, in the word armor. And so the letter A is for the word alert. We need to be on alert that what? We're at war. We need to know that. When you pick up the Bible and he starts talking about, here are the armor, the pieces of armor you need to put on. Why? Because we're at war. And what, do we, what, what do soldiers do when they are at war? They get equipped. They put their armor on and they're ready to go to battle. And so we need to be on alert. We're at war. What, what's the first R in armor? Reality. We've got to wake up to the reality that in this war, we are in a death struggle. And we are fighting for souls. That, that, that needs, that's not, just, that's not just a point that we mention. And it's not just some insignificant uh, line on a PowerPoint that says, well, here's something to fill some space. We need to understand how serious that is. What's the difference between you and an animal? What's the difference between you and your pet guinea pig? You've got a soul. I'm sorry to inform you, your pet guinea pig doesn't have a soul. God didn't give that pet guinea pig a soul. You've got a soul. You are a soul. You've got a soul that is going to live for eternity in one of two places. Your neighbors have a soul. Your co-workers have a soul. Your children have a soul. Every member of this congregation has a soul. The seven plus billion people that live on this planet have a soul. We are in a death struggle for the salvation of those souls. We need to wake up to that reality. That needs to hit us every day when we wake up. Now what's the M in armor? It's the mandate from God in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 where he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Aren't you glad that it's not your strength that God is, that, that, that we've got to rely on. Where does our strength come from? Our strength comes from God. If you're feeling weak tonight, do you know somebody who can strengthen you? God's the one. He's the one who gives us our strength, but when He strengthens us, He turns around and tells us, put on the whole armor of God. Six pieces as He de de uh, details them here. In Ephesians 6, and we cannot afford to leave one of them off. If you leave one piece of the armor off, where is Satan going to go? He's going to go right there for that weak spot. And so we, we've got to put every piece on, and when we put it on, we've got to lock it on. We've got to keep it on. What's the O in armor? We've got an opponent. We've got an enemy who is walking about every day seeking whom he may devour. Does that give you warm fuzzies to think about that? Does that, does that wait, awaken you a little bit to think about, I have, I, I have someone out there whose strongest desire is to devour me. That's not, very, that's not a pleasant thought. But that's what he wants to do. And he's going to keep coming after us thinking, thinking that he's going to be successful one of these days. Did he come after Jesus? Came after Jesus. 
an interesting verse in, in Hebrews 4 and verse 15 that Jesus was tempted, how? In all points like we are. Do you believe that verse? Do you believe He was tempted in all points like we are? You go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says He had to be. He had to be tempted in, in every point like we are so that He can be our merciful and faithful high priest. If the devil was bold enough to go after Jesus, you think he's bold enough to come after us? We've got to be awake every day knowing that he, that he is walking about seeking what he can do. What's the last R in armor? Responsibility. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why do we put on the whole armor of God? That we may be able to, to stand. We've got to be able to stand. We've got to be able to stand, he says, in the evil day and having done all to stand. Three times in these verses he uses that word stand. One time he uses the word withstand. So when we put the armor of God on, we have a responsibility before God. Not just to put the armor on, but to take a stand for what that armor represents. To take a stand for our faith, to take a stand for truth, to take a stand for God and to withstand the attacks of our opponent at every turn. The second night, we added a letter up here uh, for our uh, uh, certain friends who believed that the word was misspelled uh, without it, and so we added the letter U, so that you can have our more, or more, or however you might, sorry Jackie. Um, so what's the U all about? Who's responsible in all this? When we have a troop briefing, you know, sometimes, sometimes when, when there's a troop briefing, sometimes when there's a group project, sometimes when there is a committee who is involved in a project, sometimes you can have a meeting and think, oh, that didn't apply to me. Or think, oh, yeah, everybody else, I hope everybody else in that meeting was paying attention because none of that had anything to do with me. When you pick this up, how much of this has to do with you? Oh. <laughs> Every bit of it. And so it's not, well, I hope Lonnie was paying attention because, you know, none of this has to do with me, but Lonnie really needed this lesson tonight. Uh, nope, we all need what the Bible says, and so Lonnie needs it, and I need it just, just as much as each other. So you and I have an equal responsibility in, uh, in putting on the armor of God and keeping it on. So tonight, here we are to talk about the shoes of the gospel of peace. As we've done with each of these pieces of armor, we're going to look at the physical element, the physical part of that armor, uh, as the Romans would have seen it. We'll look at how that applies in the spiritual armor and then look at what is our responsibility. And hopefully tonight we'll spend a little bit more time on what our responsibility is in regard to that piece of armor. But here is Paul writing the book of Ephesians. You put it into this troop briefing context. He's writing this to a group of Christians who are under, uh, under assault, as all Christians are. And he's writing it from a Roman prison cell. He's there for two years under guard by a Roman soldier. And so Paul very, is very familiar with what a Roman soldier would look like. Very familiar with what a Roman soldier's uh, armor might appear to be. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, as we've looked at this, he details these various pieces of armor he says in verse 14, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But it's in verse 15 where we are tonight. Having shod your feet, that word shod ever stand out to you? As a kid, I never knew what that meant. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So Paul has, Paul has given us a description of a Roman soldier from the top, his helmet, all the way down to that, to that breastplate, to the belt, and now down to his shoes. What kind of shoes did a Roman soldier wear? Did he wear some Converse shoes? Is that what he was wearing? He wearing what, what's he wearing? Is he wearing some sneakers? 
Uh, what's he got on? He got some military boots. Uh, he's wearing sandals. Isn't that, isn't that what you would like to wear if you were going to war? I think I'll strap on my sandals. Well, that's what he did. He said, Roman soldier strapped on his sandals. And, and sometimes they were, you might call them the high tops or a, or a, a half boot uh, sandal. But you've seen those pictures of those sandals where they would, they would wrap those, uh, those leather straps all the way up the, the ankle and up the calf to keep them nice and tight. But these were, these were sandals that had spikes on the bottom. You have any sandals that have spikes on the bottom? These were sa- Why did it need to have spikes on the bottom? He's got to have a grip, doesn't he? Do you, do you, remember, do you remember when we looked at uh, Benaiah? on Sunday morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 23, uh, about how Benaiah, one of David's mighty men, uh, fought a lion in a pit on what kind of a day? A snowy day. You think he needed to have a grip on his shoes? Can you imagine being in that, in that pit on a snowy day and all you've got is bare feet or sandals slip sliding away, right? So here, here is a Roman soldier who's got spikes on the bottom of his sandals because he's going to have all sorts of terrain that he's got to go over. Not just in marching, but obviously in fighting. And a lot of times he's going to have to use that short sword, that dagger, in close hand-to-hand combat. When you look in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Which means that part of our combat is wrestling. Does he need to have some footing? Yeah. So he's got, he's got his sandals on. Now, think about the imagery that's drawn here, though. If you were a commander of a Roman army and you called your troops to be ready, and you start walking through the barracks, and somebody doesn't have their shoes on, are they ready for war? Does that remind you of some of your kids? Wait until the last possible second to put those things on. And they, you, you know where they're going to find them. They're going to find, you're, they're going to find their, their shoes right inside the front door because that's where they took them off immediately when they came in the house last time. But if you're, a, if you're a commander walking through the barracks and you see a soldier and he doesn't have his shoes on, well, he's not ready. He's not serious. He's not prepared for battle. Having those, not just the shoes themselves, but having them on showed a level of preparation on their part. And that's the emphasis here. The, the, emphasis, the emphasis of these shoes, the spiritual application, and the emphasis of these shoes is the element of preparation. Um... We're going to talk about some of the application in a little while, but I think sometimes we run to the end of the verse and say the shoes are the gospel, that you need to put, you need to put the shoes of the gospel on. And that's okay, that's true, but what does he say in verse 15? Having shod your feet with what? The preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? When you start thinking about how we are to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, I don't know if some translations have the word readiness, but that's what that word means. Is is it New American Standard or ESV uh, that's got the the word readiness uh, there for the word preparation? And and that's the idea. It, It is a, that he is ready to go to battle. That Roman soldier needed to be ready to go to battle. The Christian soldier needs to be in a state of readiness. And not just a state of readiness, but with the shoes on, there is also that firmness and that stability that's going to help keep us grounded. It's going to help us to keep our footing. Because what's one of those key words in Ephesians chapter 6, we put on the whole armor of God uh, that we may, may be able to do what? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. 
Well, you can stand without sandals, can't you? You can stand without shoes on, right? But look in verse 11. Look in Ephesians 6 and verse 11. That you may be able to stand... What's the word you have after the stand? Against. What does that mean to stand against something? Does that mean you're leaning against the fridge? I'm just kind of leaning over here, kind of prop myself up on the counter. When you stand against someone or you stand against something, you've got to have some, you've got to have some footing underneath you. What's our footing? The preparation of the gospel of peace is our footing. But in order to properly stand, we've got to have that on. We need to have made all the preparations that we can to make sure that we are equipped and, and that we are ready to fight at a moment's notice, that we're ready to move at a moment's notice, that we're ready to go wherever is necessary for us as a Christian uh, to go. And so that, that's, that's what our footing is going to allow us to do. Go over to, um, go to, go to the book of 1 Corinthians for just a second. Because our preparation with these shoes, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. What does that mean? You have your feet shod. You've got these, these sandals put on. You've got your feet prepared by the gospel. You know 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3. Paul says, For I delivered to you first of all, that which I also received. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. What, what had he delivered unto them? Of utmost importance, of first importance, he had delivered to them that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. What is that? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. What is that? That's the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Isn't that good news? Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised again. That's the gospel. So go back up to verse 1. In verses 3 and 4, he defines verse 1. Verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you, what? The gospel which he had already done what? I've already preached to you. And that's why he says in verse 3, I delivered to you of first importance the gospel. And he, he defines what it is. But back up in verse 1, he says, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you what? You stand. Think about what had transpired. These individuals in Corinth... Paul had arrived there in, in Acts chapter 18, and he had taught them the gospel. Were there, were, were there some individuals there who had some serious repenting to do before they could become a Christian? Was, is this city full of immorality? Is this city full of sin? Here are some individuals who had turned their life around in order to become a Christian. They heard the good news of Jesus, and they obeyed the gospel. And he says, so, so you heard it in, in 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 1, that I preached it to you, you received it, you have obeyed it. But as a Christian, what do you do now after you obey it? You've got to stand in it. You've got to stand firm on it. And so that's what Paul is saying back in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, what, what is... What is it that, that has prepared our feet? What has prepared our feet is the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus Christ is, 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 the, is the place where our feet stand. Now, what does he call the gospel? The gospel of what? The gospel of, of peace. Think about the irony of that statement. What's the context here? Context is war. Context is battle. The context is armor. And he calls the gospel the gospel of peace. How can it be the gospel of peace in the midst of war? Well, that's exact. That, what is God the God of? Well, he's the God of love, right? He, he, he's the God of mercy. 
He, he's the God of vengeance, some people would like to point out. But several times, twice in the book of Romans and in uh, other places, he is called the God of peace. When you think about God, is that one of the qualities that stands out? Over in Philippians chapter 4, I don't know which, what, what verse did I put up here for God? That could be Philippians 4, about verse 9 as well. Same thing is said there about the God of peace. Look in Philippians 4 for just a second, because I want you to see this contrast between verse 7 and verse 4, or verse 9, I mean. In Philippians 4 and verse 9, Paul says, The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. Follow my example. And what will happen if you do that? The God of peace will be with you. When did Paul write the book of Philippians? Same time he wrote the book of Ephesians. Philippians is one of those four prison epistles. So same setting, same context in which he's writing the book of Ephesians, he's writing the book of Philippians. If you were in prison, wouldn't you like to be thinking about the God of vengeance? who's going to take care of these people who are being mean to you? How does, God, how, how does Paul describe God? He describes Him as the God of peace. Now go back up to verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I feel like I've got to talk really loud to get over those kids in that classroom. I don't know why. If you feel like I'm shouting, it's like I, I've got to overcome the kids. Um, and with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto... Who, who, who are you supposed to let your request be made known unto? God. How is he described in verse 9? The God of what? Peace. So when I come before God and lay my petitions before Him, what am I, what, who am I laying my petitions before? The God of peace. And when I lay my petitions before the God of peace, what will He give to me in verse 7? Peace. What kind of peace? Who's peace? The peace of God. Does the world understand that? Here we are living, we are living in a time where we've got wars happening. We've got the threats of war happening. We have, uh, we have all sorts of things that are going on in our world all over the place. Does our world know peace? No. And it's almost like some people don't want it, right? It's almost like some people are more comfortable without it. But where do you suppose they would look for peace if they were to go searching? Where do most people in the world look for peace? Tangible things. Where do they look for peace, Dan? Oh, uh, that, I thought you were raising your hand. He was raising his He was doing this, okay. Uh, it, so they, they, they look for peace and substance uh, abuse of some sort. That's going to bring me peace. The world looks for peace like this, looking for love in all the wrong places. They look for peace in all the wrong places. And the last thing they would think about is turning to God to look for peace. But that's what He is. And the promise is that He will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We think about Jesus, and it's on the screen. He's the captain of our army, the captain of our salvation in Hebrews chapter 2. And He's also the Prince of Peace. Do you, when you think about a captain of an army, do you think about peace? Or do you think about war? Well, you think war. Did Jesus say something about bringing a sword? Remember what Jesus said? Did Jesus say that He came to bring a sword? Yeah. He talked about the fact that He came to bring a sword because those who would obey Him, well, they would sever themselves and somebody else would sever themselves from the person who had obeyed. There was going to, there was going to be division even among families because of those who obeyed Christ. And yet he's the prince of peace. wonder how often we turn to Jesus 
wonder how often the world would turn to Jesus and recognize that is our source of peace. Look, come back to the book of Ephesians and go to, uh, go to chapter 2. And I'll point, well, I'll point this verse out. Well, we were going to do it in a minute. We'll point it out now, and then we're going to back up a second. Look in verse 17. When Jesus came, Ephesians 2 and verse 17. When Jesus came, what did He preach? If, if, don't answer that question for a second. If I were to ask you, when Je- if we hadn't turned to Ephesians 2 and verse 17, if I had asked you when Jesus came and preached on this earth, what did He preach? You'd have all sorts of answers, right? He preached about God. He preached about the church. He preached about the kingdom. He preached about repentance. He preached about salvation. He preached about forgiveness. And he did all of that. How does Paul summarize that in Ephesians 2 and verse 17? He preached peace. What does Christ want to give us as the Prince of Peace? What does He want to give us? He came and preached peace. Now the context of Ephesians 2 is talking about the, uh, the division was talking about the strife that was going on between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so he says in this context, back up to verse 14. He says in verse 14, Christ Himself is our peace. Was there peace between Jews and Gentiles? Oh no, quite the contrary. There's no peace there. But when Christ came, what's the good news of Jesus Christ? called? What is that? The gospel. So when, the, when Jesus came, who is the good news, who is the gospel, He is our peace. And He took these Jews and Gentiles, and verse 14 says, He made both one, and He has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh, through His death, the enmity. So there was division There was enmity between individuals, and what did Jesus do? He died so that they could be brought together and they could be at peace. That's what Christ wants. Christ doesn't want division. He knew that would be the result of people obeying the gospel. He didn't want division. He wants peace. He wants to give His peace to all. And so what do we, as Christians, put it back in the context of this piece of armor. I am to wrap my feet, shod my feet, with the preparation of the gospel that is described as the gospel of peace. And it's a peace that the world cannot comprehend. Do, they, do, do, not, do people who are not Christians, do they understand you? Do they understand the peace that you have? When, when you say things to other people, when you say things to non-Christians about, well, the Lord will take care of that. Do they look at you funny? They say, He's going to do what? When, 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 you, when you say, well, I, I, I'll just trust God, He'll take care of it. Oh, really? You sorry little naive Christian, you don't know what you're talking about. Do people look at us funny? When we trust in God, and when circumstances of life seem to turn us upside down, do they look at us funny when we can still be at peace. I know it's hard to still be at peace when the circumstances of life turn us upside down. But when we come out the other side of that, stronger and with greater resolve, do they look at us and say, "What are? I don't understand you. Jesus Jesus said that. He said, I'm giving you my peace. It's not the peace that the world gives. It's it's not that kind of peace. Uh, You know, what, what is, I think today, if somebody were to define peace, they might define it as the absence of strife. Is that how people would define peace today? Peace is the absence of strife. Is that true? It's more than that. Peace is a representation. Peace is the result of, of of, uh, one result of the absence of strife. But can there be an absence of strife without there being peace? Do you have have relationships with some people? Maybe some people in your family where there's not really a lot of strife right now. Maybe there has been in the past. Maybe there's not a lot of friction right now, but you wouldn't say there's really peace either. 
Have you had some relationships like that? So peace is not just the absence of strife. Peace is something that God gives to us. That is, that is Philippians 4 and verse 6 says, is, is, and verse 7 says, is beyond our understanding. And it's something that as a Christian, if it's beyond our understanding, sometimes it's hard to explain too. Look in Colossians chapter 3 for a second. And then we're going to talk about some application of this. Look in Colossians 3. When was the book of Colossians written? Same time. So we've looked at Ephesians. We've looked at Philippians. Now we're looking at Colossians. All three of those books written at the same period of time while Paul is in prison in Rome, uh, along with the book of Philemon. Uh, that one was also written. Uh, the book of Ephesians and, Phil- or Ephesians and Colossians are sometimes called the twin epistles. They have so much in common. But look in Colossians 3 and verse 15. Let the peace of God do what? Rule in your hearts. Does anybody have anything different? Be in control. How do you let something else be in control? We want to be in control. How do you let something else rule in your hearts? You've got to let go, right? You've got to have enough trust in God that you back off and you say, God, I am going to let your peace... Now, how do we receive the peace of God? Do we have to be obedient? Do we have to follow His will? Yeah, and we're, we're going to talk about some of that in just a minute. But what an interesting verse where God says, and in this whole context, if you were to back up, look in verse 1 of Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, that means you were baptized, and then you were raised with Christ, meaning you, you, once you became a Christian, He says, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Let me ask you a question. If we would do a better job of setting our mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, would we do a better job of letting the peace of God rule in our hearts? Yeah. But when we've put all of our focus and so much of our focus on the things and the affairs and the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, guess where the peace of God is in our life? It doesn't have room. We ran it out. It's not there. Look at verse 3. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. If we would remember... I died. Remember what Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ. When I gave my life to Christ, I died. And now I am hidden with Christ in God. Think about those layers. I am with Christ, and I am with Christ in God. If I would remember that, you think I would do a better job of letting the peace of God rule in my heart? To remember the relationship that I have with God. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will, will appear with Him in glory. If I will set my sight on the coming of Christ, if I will live my daily life thinking, one of these days, and it could be today, my friend, my Savior, my Lord, my Jesus, is going to come back for me. If I would remember that, you think I could do a better job in verse 15 of letting the peace of God rule in my heart? You see, there, there, are th- there, there are blessings that we have in our life that we need to focus on. There are promises we have in our life that if we would focus on those, there'd be a whole lot more room for the peace of God to have control and to rule in our hearts. And, and if that would happen then we would do a better job of Ephesians 6 and verse 15 of having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what what do we need to do? What do we need to do to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Would it help to start with building our knowledge of that gospel of peace? Would that help? 
If, if, if my feet are to be always readied and always readied by the gospel, it'd probably be a good idea for me to learn the gospel. Probably be a good idea for, because what, what is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15? What do I need to be ready always to do? I need to be ready always to give an answer. Are there a lot of answers in this book that I need to learn to be able to give? A lot of answers. I need to get in here. I need to be ready to give an answer. I need to get into this book. And it says to add to your faith virtue in 2 Peter 1 and verse 5. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue add knowledge. I've got to get in here and grow in the wisdom uh, and, and grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of God. And when I do that, um, when I do that, I can allow that knowledge to increase my zeal. Remember what we read last night in Romans chapter 10 about the Gentiles or, or about, the, about the Jews, about Paul's fellow Jews? That they had a zeal for God, but not according to Romans 10 and verse 2. They had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Can that be dangerous? Can it be dangerous to be, on, to be on fire for God, to have zeal for God? But I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I don't have a clue what I believe. I don't have a clue what the book says, but man, I'm on fire for it. Well, I'm glad there's zeal. But he says they've got a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. And so what was the result of their zeal that was not based upon knowledge in Romans 10 and verse 3? They started establishing their own code of ethics. They started establishing their own standard of right. Or as it says there, they started establishing their own uh, basis of truth. Is that dangerous? Yeah. So what do I need to do? I need to build my knowledge of the truth so that I can have a, a zeal for God that is based upon knowledge so that now I am prepared, just like Ephesians 6 says, now I am prepared to go and teach the gospel. I'm not going to ask, don't raise your hand, all right? I'm going to ask you a question, but I don't want you to raise your hand. How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you are a Christian? How many of you studied the New Testament? And as you studied the New Testament, you learned about what Jesus did. You learned what 1 Corinthians 15 says. You learned that Jesus died for your sins. That He went to that cross as an innocent man. That He was brutally beaten and crucified. And God laid upon Him every sin of every man who's ever lived, including my own. That He died there after six excruciating hours. He was separated from His God because of my sins. He was buried in that tomb. And then on the third day, by the power of God, He was raised and proven to be both Lord and Christ. How many of you learned that? You learned what Jesus did for you. And then you learned what Jesus wanted you to do. You learned that Jesus wanted you to believe what He did for you. Believe that He is the Son of God. That you learned that Jesus wanted you to make a choice. Make a choice. Am I going to continue living for self? Continue going down the path of this life? Or am I going to choose Christ? That's what's involved in repentance. It's making a choice. A choice that says, I'm going to stop living this way and I am going to start I want to live for Christ. And having made that choice, how many of you knew and, and saw that, that God wanted us to confess the faith that we have in our hearts and then to be baptized for no other reason than what He has told us to be baptized for in this book? That all of our sins might be washed away by the blood of Jesus. And at that very moment, just as we saw in Colossians 3, when you were raised with Christ, you're a Christian. All of your sins were gone. How many of you are a Christian because you learned what Jesus did for you and then you learned what He wanted you to do? Now here's why I'm asking that question. The reason I'm asking that 
three-part question. Are you a Christian? Did you learn what he wanted you to do? Did you learn what you needed to do in order to become a Christian? Because if you answered yes to that three-part question, you know enough to go and tell it to somebody else. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You've got it. That's what it is. What Jesus did for me, what Jesus wants me to do. And if you did it, then you know it. So am I prepared? Am I prepared? Are my feet prepared? Interesting, the preparation is the feet. Could that soldier go anywhere where his feet didn't take him? Don't give me a teenage answer. All right? Teenagers say, well, if somebody carried him, you know, if he got in a car, don't, don't give me a teenage answer. Could that soldier go anywhere that his feet wouldn't take him? Nope, he's going to go wherever. So when did his feet need to be prepared to go? All the time. When do my feet need to be prepared to go? All of the time. How do my feet get prepared? They get prepared by the gospel of peace. That's my source of preparation. That's my source of preparation. You don't have to go to some theological school to become prepared. Here's your source of preparation, the gospel of peace. And now we can, with eager uh, preparation and anticipation, go and proclaim the gospel. And go and defend the gospel. Because sometimes it's not just a matter of telling somebody what I know or what I, what I have learned about what Jesus did and what He wants me to do. But here we are. What, what, what was our troop briefing? We're in war. We're under attack. And when the gospel is attacked, who's responsible for defending it? We are. We are, Scott. Being in the military, they tell us you put on, you put on your LPC, your leather personnel carrier. Your leather personnel, personnel carriers. Okay, so that, that, that's your, your LPCs. Uh, the, the soldiers got to put on their LPCs, otherwise you're not going, you're not marching. Well, that's what Christians have got to do, right? Uh, in, in order us, for us to, to march for the Lord, how many songs do we sing about marching? Can't do it unless we've got our feet prepared with the gospel of peace. And we're responsible for defending this gospel, this book, this truth, we're responsible for defending our faith, which obviously requires learning more about this gospel. We are responsible for living the gospel. We talked some about this last night. Not just about telling it to people, not just about defending it when it's attacked, but we're responsible for living it out in, in, in front of others. Look, look in, uh, there, there's, there's obviously a lot of verses on the screen. Look in Philippians chapter 1. We looked at this, we looked at the end of this verse Whatever night we talked about the shield of faith, uh, we looked at, at part of this verse because we talked about the part of this verse where it talks about us striving together, side by side, our shields locked together uh, as one formidable fo uh, force. Uh, but I want us to look at the beginning of the verse now. Philippians 1 and verse 27. Paul is in prison when he's writing this. He does not know, if you were to back up into verses 22 and 23 and following, he does not really know if he is going to be released. Uh, he's hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But he wants to remain and preach so that more souls can be won. But he says, here's what you need to do, Christians. Verse 27, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Somebody says, well, there it goes. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of the gospel of Christ, so there's no way that this verse can apply to me. Now, that's not what the verse is saying. Are any of us worthy? Not a chance. What is this saying? Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Anybody have a different word than the word worthy here? Say again. Is there any different translation? What do you got, Joyce? It says to not only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So that indicates, again, that it's not my worthiness before God that is under discussion here, but is my conduct and how I conduct myself and what manner I conduct myself that needs to be worthy. Does anybody, does anybody have a different word than the word worthy? Becoming. 
okay, in a, in a manner becoming the gospel of Christ. The word that is used here is a word that means corresponding. It was a word that, that they used back then for a balance. You know what I'm talking about with a balance where you put weights on one side, you put weights on the other side, and you balance it out. And so what Paul says here is you put the gospel on one side of that balance and you put your conduct on the other side of that balance and what's it supposed to do? Let your conduct correspond to, equal out to, measure out to, balance out to, correspond or becoming more becoming the gospel of Christ. So when I go out into the world, I don't I not only need to tell people the gospel, defend the gospel, I need to live it. They need to see my life balancing to what the message says, corresponding to what the message says. And then I need the, the last point and we're we're out of time, but I need to be prepared to meet God. Put on, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I need to live this life based upon the gospel, being prepared to meet God. Being prepared for every attack that the devil's going to throw at me. Let's close our class tonight with a word of prayer.